So this video is going to be a short video to introduce the concepts of continuity and a continuous function in real analysis. So we're going to be dealing with real valued functions of a real variable. So we'll denote our function f and it takes everything in the domain which is the real line and maps it onto an element again that's in the real line. So here's the definition then. We say that a function f is continuous at a point p in the domain, so p is an element of the real numbers, if and only if the limit as x approaches p of f of x, 1 exists and 2 is equal to the value of the function at p. If this is true for all the elements of the domain, then we say that the function is continuous over the entire domain. So if the domain is the entire real line and the function is continuous at every point in the entire real line, then we say the function is continuous over the entire real line. If the domain is a restricted interval of the real line and the function is continuous for every p as an element of that interval, then we say that the function is continuous over the entire interval. So I'm going to try my best to explain and motivate this definition. However, be aware that this is an introductory video to continuous functions for real analysis. The topic of continuous functions and continuity is massive in mathematics. In fact, there is an entire realm of mathematics called topology that is all about the study of continuous functions and continuity and the most rudimentary mathematical structure that is necessary to even be able to talk about continuous functions. So I'm going to do my best to explain this. However, be aware that there are some things that I'm not going to be able to explain properly to you and which, if you go more advanced in mathematics, you will get a much better understanding of. So for my explanation, we're going to consider a function with a smaller domain. So rather than the entire real line, I've restricted now down to the closed interval from a, b. And the reason I've done that is it means that we're going to be able to draw the entire function on a single picture. If we have the entire real line, of course, we can't manage to draw the entire picture. So we're considering a function from the interval a, b to r, and here is the interval a, b drawn on this picture here. And we're going to assume that this function satisfies this definition for every single point in our interval a, b, i.e. our function is continuous everywhere on our interval, on our domain. Now the intuitive notion of continuity from calculus is that you're able to draw the graphical representation of the function without taking your pen off the piece of paper. So you start here with a f of a and you're getting here to b f of b and you'd be able to draw this line without having to stop, lift your pen off the piece of paper and go somewhere else. You're able to draw it as one continuous line. So what we want to try and understand is why this being true for all p in the domain a b corresponds to this intuitive notion of being able to draw the graphical representation without taking your pen off the piece of paper. Now we're not going to be able to completely understand this, but at least we'll understand it to some level. If you go more advanced in your study of this, as I say, you will understand this completely. So the bit that's very easy to see is how if the intuitive picture of continuity is true, this needs to be true at every point P in the domain. The bit that's much more difficult to understand and which we're not going to attempt to explain in this video, but go more advanced in maths and I promise you will understand this, is that if this is true, it is sufficient for the intuitive picture to be true. So we're going to be able to do this arrow, that this implies this. The bit that's more complex, which we're not going to attempt to do in this video, is that this implies this. So the direction we are going to do then, so we want to understand how this being true means that this has to be true for all points P in the domain. So we'll take a general point P in our domain and we want to understand how, if it's the case that you can draw this function continuously without taking your pen off the piece of paper, it's going to mean that the limit as x approaches P of the function, 1 exists and 2 is equal to the value of the function at that point P. So to see that the limit is going to exist, imagine tracing your pen firstly from the left hand side towards the point P. You can see that if our picture is true and you're able to plot this without taking your pen off the piece of paper, then as you bring your pen closer and closer to the x value of P, you are going to approach some value. So the left hand limit 
as x approaches p is going to exist for the function if our intuitive notion of continuity is true. Equally, if you bring your pen in from the right-hand side towards p, again, if this intuitive notion of continuity is true, it's going to be approaching some value, so the right-hand limit as x approaches p is going to exist. And the two of these are going to have to equal one another. If there's any hope that you're going to be able to plot the point p without having to take your pen off the piece of paper, then these two had better be approaching the same thing. You know, imagine if they weren't approaching the same thing, then there would be a jump between the two halves of the graph, a jump discontinuity. So, if there's any hope that you're going to be able to do this, these two are going to have to exist and they're going to have to equal the same thing. So the second bit is even easier to understand. So imagine that the thing that they approach isn't equal to the value of the function at p. So I've changed the picture now. I have redefined what the value of the function is at p. So I've snatched this point out of our continuous plot here and I'm changing its value to being up here. Um, so now, the limit as x approaches p of the function is still that initial point. It's where the hole is here, but the value of the function is up here. Now, of course, this doesn't fulfill our intuitive notion of a continuous plot, because if we were drawing this, when we get to that point x is equal to p, we're going to have to wrench our pen off the piece of paper and plot a point up there and then come back down here to continue on. So it won't fulfill the intuitive notion of continuity. So it is therefore very important that this thing that your pen is approaching from either side as you get closer and closer to p is then the actual point that you then plot for f of p. If there's any hope of being able to plot the point p continuously, this is going to have to be true, that the thing that you're approaching, the natural thing that you can actually are able to plot without taking your pen off the piece of paper needs to be the thing that you actually do plot. So what I hope I've convinced you there is that this intuitive notion of continuity requires that for all points in your domain, the limit of the function as x approaches that point p is going to exist, and two, it's going to equal the value that you actually plot for that point. Understanding why this is sufficient to conclude this intuitive notion of continuity for the function is much more difficult, and as I say, we're not going to do that in this video. However, it is true, i.e. if this is true for all points p on your domain a, b, then you can conclude that you are able to graphically plot this in this continuous manner without taking your pen off the piece of paper. You will understand that, I promise, as long as you continue on your study of analysis and topology. So the final thing I'd like to talk about in this video is how you can construct new continuous functions from pre-existing ones. So let's say we now have two functions, f and g. Both of them are on the same domain, so the interval from a to b, and they're both real valued functions. And we're going to say that they're both continuous everywhere on their domain. So this is true for all points p in the interval a, b for both of them. Then you can construct new functions on this interval a, b into r like so, and you can conclude that they are going to be continuous. So if you add the two functions together, you'll get a third function, and from the fact that these two are continuous, you can conclude that f plus g is going to be a continuous function. If you multiply either of them, and I've chosen f to be the one that I multiply, by just a real number, so lambda is some real number, uh, then you'll get a new function, and you can conclude that function will be continuous on the interval a, b. If you multiply the two functions together, f times g, again, you'll get a third function on the interval a, b into r, and you can conclude that that function will be continuous everywhere on the domain. Finally, if you quotient the two, so if you take f divided by g, then again, you can conclude that that will be continuous everywhere on the interval a, b, provided that this function g is not equal to zero anywhere on the interval a, b. So if g maps a, b into r and nowhere in that interval, so no p inside that interval is mapped onto zero, then you're safe. You can construct this new function f divided by g and you can conclude that that will be continuous on the interval a, b. So these results all follow from the algebra of limit results. Let's go through them quickly. So we'll start with f plus g. So if we want to prove that this new function f plus g is going to be continuous everywhere, we need to prove that this is going to hold true for all p in the domain. So consider a point p in the domain. We want to show that limit as x approaches p of our function, which is f of x plus g of x, is going to equal f of p plus g of p. 
but by the algebra of limits, we can split this into the limit as x approaches p of f of x plus the limit as x approaches p of g of x, because we know that both of these limits are going to exist by the fact that f and g are continuous. Then we know what this limit is equal to, it's f of p by the fact that this is continuous, and we know what the limit as x approaches p of g of x is going to be, it's going to be g of p. So we have then shown what we needed to show, that this is equal to f of p plus g of p. So the next one follows the exact same strategy, just a different algebra of limits result. So we need to show for all points p in our interval that the limit as x approaches p of lambda f of x is equal to lambda f of p. So because we know that f is continuous, we know that the limit as x approaches p of f of x exists. So that means that we can apply the algebra of limit result to this to turn it into lambda times the limit as x approaches p of f of x. Also, because we know f is continuous, we know what this is actually equal to. It's equal to f of p. So it's therefore lambda times f of p, which is exactly what we needed to show. For the third one, to show that this is continuous, again, we need to show for a general point p that this is true. So we need to show that the limit as x approaches p of f of x, g of x, is going to equal f of p times g of p. Because of the fact that f and g are continuous, we know that the limit as x approaches p of f of x exists, and the limit as x approaches p of g of x exists. So by the algebra of limit result, we can now say that this is equal to this times this. And then because these two are continuous, we know not only that they exist, but what they're actually equal to. So we know that this is equal to f of p, and this is equal to g of p. Therefore, it's equal to f of p times g of p, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Finally, the only one that's slightly more technical, the quotient. So if we want to show that this is continuous for all points, again, we need to show that for a general point p, the limit as x approaches p of f of x over g of x is equal to f of p over g of p. The reason that we can conclude this is because we know f and g are continuous, so we know that the limit as x approaches p of f of x exists, and we know the limit as x approaches p of g of x exists. Now, in order to be able to apply this algebra of limit result, we need to know that this thing on the bottom is never going to equal zero for any p in our domain. The reason we know that is we know the function is never equal to zero at any point p in the domain. And we know from the fact that it's continuous that the limit for all points p is equal to the value of the function at that point p. So if the value of the function is never equal to zero, then the limits can never equal zero. So we know this is never going to equal zero, so we can then apply this algebra of limits result. So we'll get that the limit as x approaches p of f of x over g of x is the limit as x approaches p of f of x over the limit as x approaches p of g of x. And then we know what these two things are equal to. This is equal to f of p and this is equal to g of p, which is what we required. So a simple corollary that's going to follow from the results that we've just shown is that all polynomial functions are going to be continuous over the entire real line. And we're going to be able to conclude this just from the fact that these two functions are continuous over the entire real line. So one of the functions is f of x is equal to 1, a constant function, and the other is f of x is equal to x. So hopefully you believe that these two functions are continuous. I've plotted them here. So here is f of x is equal to 1, and here is the function f of x is equal to x. So if we consider a general point p, hopefully it's clear that the limit as x approaches p for these two functions is going to equal the value of the function. So for the constant function 1, as you approach p from either direction, the function is 1 everywhere. So it's just going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So the only thing that you can ever approach is going to be 1, and of course that's going to be the value at a general point p as well. So the limit is going to equal the value of the function. For the function f of x is equal to x, then as you approach p you can see that you're going up from the left hand side and down from the right hand side, and you're going to approach the value that the function actually is equal to, which is going to be p, and that's going to be the case for all values of the function. So now, from the fact that these two are continuous over the entire real line, you can conclude that any multiple of them is continuous over the entire real line. So we'll call the multiple that we're multiplying 1 by, we'll call that k0, so it's just some general real number. So any function f of x is equal to k0, where k0 is a real number, is now going to be continuous over the entire real line. Equivalently, we can multiply this one. So we'll call the multiple that we're multiplying x by k1, uh, for the coefficient of the first degree. Um, so now any function k1 of x is also going to be continuous over the entire real line.
now from the fact that all of these functions are continuous over the entire real line, we can then add any two of these together to get something of this form, k1 times x plus k0, and we can conclude that's going to be continuous over the entire real line, where k1 and k0 are now general elements of the real line. So we've then got all polynomials of degree 1, all possible polynomials of degree 1 that you can possibly think of are going to be continuous over the entire real line. Also from the fact that f of x is equal to x is continuous over the entire real line, you can now multiply this by itself, and then by this rule, the thing that you'll get is going to be continuous over the entire real line. So that means that the function x squared is going to be continuous over the entire real line, because that's just x times itself. Then what we can do is we can take this function x squared and this function x and multiply them together to get x cubed, and that one's now guaranteed to be continuous over the entire real line. And then we can take this one and multiply it by x again to get x4 is going to be continuous over the entire real line. So we can get all these possible powers of x are going to be continuous over the entire real line. Then we can conclude any multiple of them will be continuous over the real line. So kn xn is going to be continuous over the entire real line, and then of course we can take any combination of these added together to get any general polynomial is going to be continuous over the real line. So any general polynomial function p of x which is equal to k0 plus k1x plus all the way up to kn xn is going to be continuous over the entire real line because all of these things that it's built out of by addition are going to be continuous over the entire real line. We can even consider rational functions like this, which are things where you have one polynomial in the numerator and then another polynomial in the denominator. And we're going to be able to conclude that this function is going to be continuous using this rule, provided, of course, that the domain that we're talking about is such that there are no roots, there's no places where this denominator polynomial is going to equal zero on that domain. So if your domain is going to be the entire real line, you're going to have to pick this denominator polynomial carefully so that it's got no roots anywhere in the real line. So it's going to need to therefore be a polynomial of even degree, because any polynomial of odd degree will have at least one root in the real line somewhere. Uh, but polynomials of even degree don't necessarily have to have a root in the real numbers if you pick them carefully. Alternatively, you can just restrict your domain down so it's just an interval of the real line that we're talking about, and you can pick that interval so that your denominator polynomial isn't ever zero in that interval, and then you're going to be able to conclude that this thing is going to be continuous over that interval. So we'll end the video there. Thank you for watching.